we're going to do, first of all, uh, remote inspection, uh, which is a very sort of key technology, and also then the thrusting technologies that we need to then perform these missions. I'll then move on to some of the more sexier things, which is, of course, the actual Kinect, some of the software demonstrations and videos, um, and then some of the docking mechanisms, and I've actually got some hardware with me. So, in brief, STRAM1 uh, stands for Surrey Training Research and Satellite Demonstrator. Uh, this is the naked picture of it uh, that you can see here. So we have our classic stack, uh, and then we have a payload bay for any non-PC-104 conforming parts. Key thing, um, it's Surrey Space Center and Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, volunteer effort, okay? Um, and it's got some key things on there, mainly uh, AOCS, but also it's got the smartphone technology again. Testing as a payload. This is sort of a classical satellite design using all these bits and bobs as payloads, okay? We've never flown them before. We don't know that it'll work in space, um, but we've got good ideas about it. <coughs> so that's roughly uh, what it looks uh, like together from all the last shots. Yesterday, uh, if you wanted to see uh, what each of the individual flight parts looks like, I have all my presentation here. So if you wanted to go back over it, do just get in touch and we can go through it again. So the Strand 2 mission. Essentially what we want to do, rendezvous and docking, uh, and which requires us to do sort of some sort of remote inspection first. So the idea is, is that we have two CubeSats. They will get simultaneously deployed out of their uh, generic pods, whether it's a P-Pod, an X-Pod, or an ISIS pod doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and in that time after commissioning, one of the things you're going to want to do uh, during that time is obviously make sure that you can detumble your satellite and put it in what's what we call a wire Thompson spin. So what we then start to do is sort of spin around one principal axis, um, and then we can start doing three axis stabilized uh, maneuvers. Okay? Very important if you're fr thrusting your, fire, uh, your thruster and you need to go and rendezvous with something that you're not already spinning or you've got weird moments, and uh, you can actually go away and do these things. So after that, what we actually do is, it depends on how long it takes for us to commission, that will tell us roughly how long we're going to drift apart. Um, with regards to the actual deployment, I'll come to that uh, in a minute, and we'll go over some pretty funky videos as well. Uh, but the idea is, is that we'll eventually dock uh, and actually use a LiDAR system uh, based on the Microsoft Connect, so that we can actually then connect our satellites together. Um, and the real use for this is that you can then start to do things um, that other missions are doing, um, but knocking off zeros. Uh, and really starting to open up the imagination of perhaps not only can we, what can we do if we rendezvous and deck, uh, dock, uh, what if we wanted to inspect a geospacecraft for damage, uh, if something's gone wrong with a very, very expensive asset, um, or also what do we want to do if we want to build something in space? You know, these are just all sorts of technologies to sort of explore all these new things, exactly like the ISS did. So moving on to the orbit dynamics, really what we want to do is operate in what we call a cloaked close proximity relative motion sort of frame. So the real question, how to deploy? Single launch versus multi-launch vehicles um, and limited to the deployment delta V. So usually you get a sort of one to five meters per second sort of kick out of a pod. It's based on a spring coefficient. Um, you know, it's not hugely technical. But you know, if you have a single launcher, of course you can lower your costs. Um, but if you insert them in the wrong place, you have a real greater uh, risk of collision. Um, again, needs propulsion to prevent that collision. But with multiple launches, you have, obviously you need two rockets. That's huge cost already. Um, but then obviously the lower risk of collision. Again, but you need propulsion to catch up to the formation. And that's actually quite, quite extensive. Either way, you still need these propulsive capabilities if you're going to actually go away and want to do some of these things. So what do we do about it? Okay. I'm sorry it's a Sunday. And there are equations on a board. Um, if you want more, I can do that. That's not a problem. Um, what we're essentially doing is uh, we're using a linearized sort of orbital frame. So those of you that do and study astrodynamics, uh, we have a standard frame called the ECI frame, uh, which we use to model how satellites uh, move around an orbit. So there are equations of motion based on the Keplerian laws. And this is essentially a linearization about that. So what we do is we essentially take a box and we linearize sort of motion in our plane. Now, the important part to recognize here is that what we actually do is we redefine it so that X is our up now, okay? Y is our long track, okay, along your velocity vector, and Z is the motion sort of coming out to the side. And what essentially pops out at the end of all of these equations um, is these two equations here. So X is our up, okay? And it's primarily dominated by this Y term. So if, if you wanted to have some X velocity, 
Okay, you really want to be pushing it along a bit and out, and then that can push you up. It means it's doing this. And likewise, there's a coupling here, and this omega turn here is the mean motion of the orbit. So depending on what your attitude is, uh, altitude is, then you can actually start to play around with some of these numbers quite easily in simple equations. And of course, if you can exploit that, we can do it easily and quickly on board. There's no real matrix manipulations. There's no integration if you're doing a full orbit propagator. Um, these are sort of some standard things you can do, and these equations have been around since the 70s. So what does it look like when you're on a deployer? Well, what we've been developing is a tool called Sat Launcher, and here uh, is just one of the orbital frames. And you can see this rocket here. Uh, it's currently static at the moment. I have other videos. And depending on where you're going and where you're pushing yourself off, uh, will cause you to drift and do different orbits. When everyone thinks about orbits going around the Earth, they're kind of just doing this standard thing. That's completely not true. Depending on how they're deployed um, and what sort of velocities and things are involved, they will be spinning around. They will be doing all these sort of weird helix type shapes. Um, note this guy here, any plane motion okay, that is just in the uh, off-track plane uh, will actually cause you to then just oscillate back and forth. Okay? Really, really bad. And what we can do with this is we can then start to look at, well, how far away from we from all these other sort of craft? How far away from me uh, am I from all these different systems? So we can start to really explore how it will look like. You know, if we wanted a certain separation, what do we need to do? So if I wanted to say, well, this, this track here looks quite good. It's got a good drift rate away from our launcher. What I need to do then is just rotate my launcher and have it launch back off at the same angle. And of course, you've got then errors involved with that. You know, if, whether it's a NEPA or some other craft, they can only say we can guarantee you one degree accuracy. You know. And it's then just looking at your tolerances and figuring out whether or not that's acceptable or not. But what you could have uh, is you could have quite a big mess. Uh, certainly, if you're looking at sort of large emissions that are looking to deploy uh, large numbers of craft like QB50 does, um, you have to be very careful how you're going to be deploying these. You do not want them to come back and hit yourself. Okay? You do not want them to come back and hit the upper stage as that deorbits. Okay? All of these sort of little accelerations and things needs to be figured out. Um, and I guess I can kind of gloss over some of these things, but depending on where you push yourself out, you end up doing weird loops. And you can either push a satellite to go up in an orbit and be slightly higher, or push them to go further down. Uh, really depends on what you want. But you can put these equations into any old tool yourself um, and pop the numbers at yourself. And what really comes out of this is when we actually look at it compared to like a high precision propagator when you've got the drag, you've got acceleration pressure, all the other perturbations, is that over sort of three orbits, you have a drift of about two kilometers, uh, about 580 kilometers. Um, the relative drift, though, between our actual spacecraft, even if you said one went out at a meter, one went out you know, just slightly you know, faster or slower, you know, then that's only 150 meters. You know, the actual drift rates can actually be very low if you can control that deployment. And what we've been then working on is saying, well, if we can then figure out how far it is we drifted, well, what is the actual thrust profile you need to do? One of the things you need to be able to do with your craft is you need to say, I need to shoot up this much, down that much, along that way a bit much, uh, so that you can then go ahead uh, and get yourself back. And what pops out at the end of this is really sort of very, very low delta V costs. So for those of you that do propulsion stuff, 0.4 meters is actually quite, quite a small amount to make sure that you can maintain sort of orbits and maintain these things. And so we've got a whole PhD sets of research uh, on the optimal thrust trajectories uh, in relative motion. And we can talk about them later. Now, this is just with one satellite, OK, going to visit the other one. Obviously, if they've both got thrusters, it's much, much cheaper just to meet in the middle or to meet in a, some sort of plane where actually you're just doing this and you're just slightly out of phase of each other. Okay, so there's lots and lots of different possibilities for this. So what does the system look like? The existing strand avionics, you saw it all yesterday. Um, the upgrades that we have on there, we're looking at some different structures. Um, increased tank size and thrusting capability. Uh, what we actually have here is five sets of thrusters now with a larger tank in the middle. Uh, there will certainly be room uh, for other experiments, um, but it will also include... Uh, sort of the, the LiDAR sort of system that we would have uh, based on the Kinect, uh, and as well as the standard sort of avionics for each your EPS, your computers, and everything else that you find. For the purposes of our assessment, we said, well, if you've got five kilo spacecraft, 
depending on what sort of thrusters you've got, um, you know, what can we do with 10 meters per second? It's actually quite, quite a lot for a CubeSat. You know, whether or not you're pushing yourself up or down for deorbiting purposes, or whether or not you're trying to do something to visit other spacecraft. Um, and then we just ha then said, well, we'll have six meters per second for maneuvers, uh, four meters for doing some very minor attitude pieces, uh, and contingency. Okay, so that if we do need to deorbit and push ourselves down, then we actually can. And so it's a fairly classical design. You've got a field drain valve, which ain't got some sort of temperature sensors and fitters. Uh, isolation valves, some plenum there that goes on to heating, and then you've just got the banks of thrusters, and you can control them. We can control them over I squared C sort of devices with feedback. Butane was chosen really because uh, it goes ahead with a four bar maximum uh, operating pressure that we wanted to operate that we know is pretty safe for CubeSats uh, over nitrogen and xenon because it has, again, a great uh, atomic density um, and it provides uh, a very good specific impulse. And also because we actually have quite a lot of heritage in using butane systems. So we've got 10 millinewtons of thrust with registered jets, 80, meter, uh, 80 second ISP uh, for cold gas, uh, and it can go higher if we wanted to really, really heat it up. And then we use some standard products from Lee uh, for our drain valves uh, and a custom machined uh, aluminium tank uh, with swag lock joints. So this is really what it looks like again, just to give you an idea of what it, on the top, sort of five sets of thrusters so that we can actually have full control uh, and it can be very, very quick and agile. Uh, one of the things we'll obviously need on this design, we will be using our, our strand nano wheels that we've been developing uh, to dump momentum uh, should there be too much uh, moments pitching around uh, the system. Uh, you notice that the tank was in the middle as well. Depends where our center of mass and pressures actually are on the craft. We are making sure that those are taken care of quite effectively as well. Uh, but either which way though, you'll be able to do attitude and orbit maneuvers with varying combinations. So that's kind of the propulsion. Now, LIDAR uh, is laser light detection and ranging. Um, and we use it obviously on the ISS and they have a very, very expensive system which looks very similar to this. The actual one is actually much, much bigger than this. This is a special optical table uh, that you have which has special vibration feet so that when you walk in the room, your laser isn't just doing this all the time. Um, and there are essentially two, two types, and everyone knows the time of flight one. You shoot it off, you get a signal back, okay? And that's pretty much what they do. It just looks like, uh, you know, space invaders when they go, and they're just shooting them, and it's just thinking it's, like it's going to be returning back. Uh, but the other one is actually a newer one, which is pattern recognition systems. You can shoot a pattern of light onto something, uh, and you can just passively detect what return you get. Something's there, uh, then you will get a return. And that's actually what's why we chose using the Microsoft Connect. When we did uh, orbital studies and when I've done other uh, missions to do inspection, one of the key things that came out of that was you're not always in sunlight. Okay? Not, you're either, A, staring at the sun, which is really, really bad for your sensors. Okay? It's emitting all sorts of things in IR, in all sorts of different bands, um, when you're in sort of this sort of motion, or uh, you're in complete darkness. So classical camera systems, whether it be stereo or not, just really aren't going to work for us in these sort of situations. So the idea is, is that we move away from that and we go onto a LiDAR-based system. So the standard Connect, uh, you've all seen them, uh, actually has a couple of very, very neat parts. It has um, a particular IC in it, this uh, PS1080 uh, system on chip, which actually does the real bulk and grunt of all the work that's on there. Uh, the other thing that's uh, really great about the Connect is uh, this actual um, uh, diffraction grating here. So when the Connect actually has a uh, 65 milliwatt laser, which for any of you that actually work with lasers is actually quite a powerful sort of class two laser. It will certainly blind you if you were to take it apart. So don't take it apart, by the way. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't advocate that. It goes through a lens, it then goes through a grating, uh, which essentially splits and refracts all of the lights. And what you get is you essentially get two things. You get a nice sort of speckled pattern uh, on an area, but you also get this checker grid. You can only just make it out there. Apologies to our internet colleagues there. I'll make sure that the slides are available. Uh, you have a checker grid as well. So they can track that checker grid, and they can also track these little points, these speckles on here. And what's really great about these speckles is that when you look at these different sizes and shapes that they have, uh, you can then detect something about the material and the actual surface at which it's hitting. Okay. Stretched sort of these uh, ellipses that you'll see, uh, you will then figure out that Actually, it's actually on this angle or it's at this angle, and you can start to detect an object. It needs to be specular reflection, though. That's the other thing. Very brief piece about software. There are lots of ways that you can 
you can go about doing software. There's the Microsoft SDK, uh, has tons and tons of stuff that's on there for gesturing and doing things with people. If you're waving about things and you're like, hey, yeah, that, that works, that's quite good, what can you do? Facial recognition, they've got a lot of stuff for all sort of high level uh, APIs. Uh, we're not interested in that. There's not gonna be anyone in front of our camera going, hello, waving at us. Uh, we need to get rid of that. Also, we're limited to Windows. I don't like that, A. Uh, and all of the drivers are all pre-compiled DLLs, and I can't mess around with any of the code. Okay? One of the things I love doing is just hacking things to pieces, um, which is actually why we went for this Open Connect uh, option. Um, and the Open Connect option really does uh, provide you with everything you need. Uh, works Windows, Linux, Mac OS, is whatever you want it to. Um, and the source code is all, is all open source. Uh, you can get that. You can download that now. Um, and I would advise you to do that if you really wanted to play around and mess around with the Connect. So what are we trying to achieve? This is uh, a mission called Prisma, uh, which actually takes, uh, which has one called Mango and Tango, and it's essentially a 150-ish kilo uh, microsatellite, uh, and this is essentially a 50 sort of 60 kilo satellite, and it's actually doing and uh, confirming all those equations that we had, okay, that we saw earlier, okay. We know they work. Okay, we know that relative motion works, uh, and when they do these maneuvers, they can do that. Okay, and so this is a mission with Swedish Space Corps and DLR, uh, very very high cost uh, sort of mission in comparison to my CubeSat domain in which I firmly sit and just try and plug away in. Um, but this is essentially what we're trying to do. Okay, we want to be able to get these images, um, but we want to be able to do it when it's in the dark. Okay, they can only get these images every now and again, every other orbit if the sunlight's in the wrong position you get nothing. Uh, we want to be able to do it all the time. So what do we do with the Connect? We started to calibrate it. One of the things that's important when you're looking at these things is if you've got some sort of lens deformation uh, that's on the top of that, uh, you need to know if there's a deformation towards the edges. So that if you think that the angle which you need to go to is that and you do a thrusting and actually, no, it's over there, uh, then you're in trouble. So we would spent a lot of time figuring out really what was going on on the lens, okay? Uh, and we've tested about three of these, and they're actually quite generic, okay? Uh, and we can look at what the pixel uh, projection is, uh, an error is, okay? So you can actually see that really, you know, you've got a maximum there of maybe one pixel either side. Um, and but based on your range, that'll either put you out by a certain distance, okay, and by a certain angle. But what we can do then is we can then reconstruct it. You know, if we've got our camera here, we can then re reconstruct what our checkerboards actually look like. Uh, we can figure out uh, where they were. And so we can confirm in our own models without any dependence on any other software that what works actually does work. And so now what I want to show you is actually some of our experiments that we actually did. So uh, in uh, the Space Center, we actually have a, a higher bay that we've taken over from uh, SSTL. And what you can actually see here is a CubeSat model uh, hung up on what appears to be quite a very high technical and state-of-the-art piece of string uh, that moves along a rail. Um, and what we can then see is we can actually see sort of what sort of return, what would we actually expect back um, from this sort of mission, okay? Um, and we can actually then detect all sorts of things. We can play around with our ranges, we can play around with the filters, um, and we can actually start to get some usable results. But what does that look like in IR? So that's what you get out at the moment from the actual system on a chip uh, processor. Uh, and that is uh, about 30, about 27-ish frames per second. As soon as you want to take it out raw, um, it's the frame rate drops. You're not passing it through uh, anything, and the frame rate really, really drops. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll skip on, because I'm, I'm aware of time, and you can actually see the cube set here. Uh, well, you can see the string as well, but you can actually start to see where the reflections and where the glints really start to go on the corners and the edges of things. If you're trying to detect a structure that's got an inflatable, probably isn't going to work quite as well. As well, so your project, you know, having nice flat surfaces is actually perfect for what we want to do. So what do we do? We've got uh, vacuum chambers over in the space centre uh, that we've uh, we've either bought very, very, very cheaply off of Astrium, uh, or we've actually got ourselves. And what we've been doing is we've been uh, testing the Connect hardware. Uh, one of the things that I'm very concerned with is the actually laser temperature. Uh, you need to have a very, very stable t temperature uh, for the concept to, to really work and to give you the accuracy that you want um, in those systems. 
and you can just see, have an idea of there of sort of the chambers that we've got over there. We've got five now over in the chamber. So this is essentially what it looks like uh, with the CAD model. This is what it looks like broken down in one of our systems. Um, and I actually have, have it here. So what you can actually see, pass it around. This one, again, uh, I am the Lord of Destruction, so I have, it's fully broken, this one. Um, you can have a play around with it afterwards, but this is essentially what you've got in that. Okay, the thing usually consumes about 12 watts, uh, which is like a motor. It includes all sorts of other bits and bobs. Uh, when you start to strip it out, I don't need six microphones in there. I don't need the audio card in there. I can hack around with one of the boards to get rid of a particular interface and short that part of the circuit out. Um, then you can actually reduce the power down quite effectively, and then it just becomes just about almost two watts-ish uh, of, of power is actually what it really consumes. The next thing that we really want to do is we then want to say, well, now that we've broken it down, how is that actually going to work? So that's really what we were, we were doing. So I know that I'm uh, pushed for time, so I'm going to move very quickly on to our uh, docking mechanisms. Um, we've used fast prototyping, uh, as is everyone. We have our own fast prototyping uh, facilities, so we can actually build up our own structures. Uh, we've got whole CubeSats and bits and bobs made up from a couple of PhD students that are making all sorts of structures and playing around with materials. Um, and it's allowed us to build up some models of what strand uh, one is actually gonna, uh, strand two sorry, is actually going to do. And so what we've got is we've got some ducted fans. Um, we then have some Arduino controller pieces uh, in the middle, uh, so the, and then a docking port and some lithium polymer batteries, and then a top docking port. Okay? Um, what you see here is you then see we've got uh, uh, an air cushion table, and these things will move along and push along over, over there with the magnetics. What you actually see here uh, is our CubeSats being guided by these fans on the side uh, to, uh, to be able to dock uh, onto the system and, work, uh, and have the magnetics sort of work. As you can see, it's kind of oscillating back and forth there because it's essentially sitting on the cushion and the fan control isn't, isn't very precise, actually. We need to change those fans for something more respective, like a thruster. And then you can see it pushing its way off as the magnetics just gets reversed. Key thing about this, software. Okay? If you're going to do this sort of thing, you have actually quite a complex uh, control loop of not just sensing your information, but then controlling your actuators. So you can go through a series of sensing, predicting what you're going to do in the future, filtering that uh, to then give you control algorithms in the future. And so really, this was a, this was a culmination of a study we had from the, the UK Sp uh, Space Agency, one of the 14 that got uh, actually funded. And really, we, we want to carry on doing it. The Strand, as you know, has all been a, a volunteer effort. Uh, and we've been able to hack around these things uh, to buggery for quite a long time. And it would be great if we could incorporate it as part of the national mission as well. Um, and with that, uh, I'll be really happy to take any of your questions. Any, any questions, anybody? Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot there to go on. Quite a lot. I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Docking maneuvers. Mm -hmm. um, you've got two identical satellites. Both of them are independently capable of, of uh, changing their position. Mm -hmm. Does one of them have to be the master in, in a docking maneuver? And then do you have established communication between the two? No. So the, the thing is with uh, all the formation for land missions that you have is people make assumptions, and assumptions are the bugbear of any engineering solution that needs to be bulletproof. Okay? So the idea is, is actually both targets are completely uncooperative. Okay? Uh, if you do that, you then maintain safety. If you know that you're going to be in a place where it's going to prevent you from docking, the best thing would be to back off, uh, which is exactly what the ISS does. So if, when, when the ISS actually does its maneuvers and docks to the station, it actually does this loop, and it's slowly drifting and drifting towards its target like this, and it's drifting, and then it will dock. Okay? If it knows that it's going to miss it and hit the underside or go right past it, they just back off for a bit. And so you essentially play around with those parameters to make sure that you can dock effectively. But that's got a human in the loop. That one has a human in the loop. These equations you saw are actually very, very simple. Um, they've got you know, quite large LiDAR systems. Uh, and if you can detect the target at long enough range, uh, then there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, so I guess the Connect is a fairly uh, limited range, um, so, oh, right. and you're starting off from maybe 150 meter separation. So 
Um, how do you close that initial distance and uh, how do you know the position of the spacecraft so sort of accurately enough to do that? Yeah, so the positions uh, are, they all have GPS receivers on them uh, and you know them within a certain accuracy depending on what GPS receiver and models that you actually use, uh, you can actually bring that down to probably about 50 meters uh, sort of knowledge orbitally. Uh, and relative, that's, that's absolutely fine to get you within that. One of the things we want to do is actually uh, is get rid of that particular lens. We actually have uh, another camera, which is a fisheye lens, which can actually do visual detection at quite a large range. And we want to have this one beam at such a, a more narrower uh, straight. So here on Earth, the Connect actually will go anywhere, probably up to about 20 meters, and that's in our atmosphere. As soon as you go out, out of our atmosphere, that wave propagates for much, much longer. Um, so you can actually get much more extended range. And what I need to do is find out what those limitations are. Um, but first, I have to finish strand one. <laughs> yes? Uh, the docking mechanism. Sure. Uh, when you, when we... Uh, when, when we used to see these things going on on the telly, mm -hmm. they used to have very marked crosses and things to enable the automatic detection of, uh, of the spacecraft coming up to dock to line up with the cross. That's a human in the loop. There's a human in the loop. For crosshair, so. yeah. Because the latest thing on this, uh, this SpaceX thing, I think that was all automatic on the uh, ISS. Yes, yeah, so the ATV yeah, is fully automatic. Uh, and that crosshair is just there so that you know where your central pixel is. Right. Uh, and when you, can, when you do that, you'll know what your offset is because there, there is an attitude issue as well. You don't want to be coming slightly slide on uh, when you dock. Yes. The good thing about this magnetic interface is actually it will it'll actually uh, work at about 30 centimetres. So, so long as we're in that 30 centimetres, they will naturally want to align. Right. So as you saw, the other one sort of rocking back and forth. Yes. It's because the other one was fixed against a large table they would actually start align automatically and then they just go boom. Is there any chance that these things might repel? Like you, when we were kids we played with magnets in the science lab. And uh, so the, the mechanism is actually three sort of prongs uh, and it will want to align. It will? Yeah, so they're electromagnets. So oh, that's can, okay then. Yeah. Steve? Could you talk a little bit about the unshocking Sure, so just exactly like you saw in that deployment video Knowing what the acceleration is as you push each other away uh, is, again, very, very important. And so what you need to do is make sure that actually one is, cut, is either shooting slightly up and one is shooting slightly down. So when you want to undock, uh, what you push them up like that, one will want to naturally drift up that way, one will naturally want to drift down that way. Okay? Um, and then it's, it's very safe. If you do it so that there is no uh, radial component, you will run at a risk of it just going plop. And if it's just cross-track, then it will just go. The force. Oh yeah, the actual accelerator. Well, that's here on Earth, and you saw that getting pushed, you know, quite fast away. That's got more than a couple of meters per second uh, accelerations away. When that's actually in free space, the acceleration is actually quite, quite high. Information overload, I know, but I would love to take your questions, perhaps after the break. Yeah, certainly, well, you'll be available in the in the, uh, the break itself. Oh yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. So thank you very much, Chris. Thanks very much.